with great power comes great responsibility. Will we finally use our power and take the responsibility of putting a live action Spider-Man movie into the Pantheon? Yes, that's right. We are back for a summer giant-sized annual as we discuss Spider-Man No Way Home. Where are we going? I don't know, your house! No! I'll kill you! I thought you said you'd never really like me! No! Well, not anymore! Hello, Peter. Do I know you? We started getting some visitors from every universe. This is all my fault. My problem is all fixes. We're gonna get through this. Ah! We're gonna get through it together. December 17th. And welcome back to Superhero Pantheon for the first time in about a year or so. On this podcast, what we do is we take one movie, determine whether it belongs in the Pantheon, the pile of shame, or somewhere in between. My name is Jerome Cusan. Uh, You can find additional episodes of this podcast through Apple Podcasts and all of your other podcast apps through the real world, including Spotify. Uh, Please leave a four or five star review so as to help people discover the great work that we are doing here at The Real World and to help people discover this show and the work that Matt and Ben and Kevin and Mike Thomas and all those people are doing. My co-host for this week and every week is Brian DeBrain. Brian, all I can say is we have not done one of these Superhero Pantheon episodes in quite some time, but we are going to be doing a couple this year. Uh, We will be doing, so this is a weird month. August, of course, has five Tuesdays, and we decided, okay, for this fifth Tuesday, uh, we are going to uh, put and discuss Spider-Man and uh, determine whether it belongs in the superhero pantheon. There is another five Tuesday month coming up in the month of October. Uh, We may or may not do another pantheon episode as well. Uh, but I know that this is a movie that is definitely in contention for the superhero pantheon, Spider-Man No Way Home, from December 2021. And Brian, I know this is one that you have very much been anticipating, having a discussion about, and as burned out on superhero movies as I am, and we could get maybe get into that a little bit later, uh, this is one that is worth discussion. Absolutely. And uh, this was a great, great, great time in the theater. Never going to forget it. It was one of the most electric, uh, you know, emotional audiences I've ever been a part of. Up there with the Avengers uh, Endgame audience and the uh, Infinity War audience, actually. But yeah, just a tremendous night when I saw this movie for the first time. Got it on the Blu-ray, watched it a bunch of times. And, uh, you know, I go on YouTube every once in a while and still get emotional watching some certain scenes, especially with Doc Ock and then the three spider man just having a conversation together, all those kind of great things. And this movie, looking back, is kind of a miracle. You know what I mean? It's kind of a miracle to get all three spider man together, a miracle that this script came together the way it did and the way it actually kind of fits. I mean, yeah, there's going to be a bunch of plot holes given multiverse shenanigans and whatnot, and certain things don't line up in terms of other movies' plot lines. But in the end, you get the payoff emotionally, and I think that's what matters. And these characters stick with you, and the fact that, you know, I'm pretty sure your theater got some pops too when, you know, the Spider Man came out from the past. Uh, you know, I didn't notice it until like a couple times when I was watching some of the reactions on YouTube, but a lot of the females were the ones popping for <laughs> for a certain Spider Man while the uh, the males were popping for the other Spider Man. I'll let you figure that out. But uh, yeah, it was just an interesting kind of like social you know, experiment kind of looking back and how nostalgia works on the brain and how it affects us, you know, us and how it affected the box office because we never saw Andrew Garfield or Tobey Maguire in any of the trailers and the anticipation, the buzz built just, you know, based on the fact that Doc Doc was in it, the fact that we got Green Goblin in it, all that anticipation, not even showing the main actors, got them all the money. And then, you know, of course, a couple of weeks I mean, later, they revealed it. it's one of those things where they... Just like when CM Punk debuted for AEW, they they told you the Spider-Man were going to be in the movie without explicitly telling you they were going to be in the movie. And just as 
the United Center sold out on the promise of CM Punk returning to AEW. Numerous screenings for this movie were also sold out to the point where my friend and I had to go to the uh, to go to a different theater than we usually go to. It was absolute chaos. It was t- absolutely uh, packed for this screening of Spider-Man that I went to on that Saturday. And in many ways, this is the first movie uh, that really found a high level of success beca- during the COVID era, so to speak. And look, I'm a firm believer that even as much as so many people want to say that COVID is over, it is not. So I, I do not believe in using the term post-COVID, and we're not going to do so here. But it's pretty remarkable to me that this movie uh, just came out and just roared at the box office in a big way. This is the movie that I think... I think in some ways, I think it tricked people into thinking that the the box office was back. And in many ways, I still don't think it is all the way back, even though we're coming off the recent Barbenheimer weekend, which may actually be a much better indicator of a potentially healthier box office. But this is definitely the movie that got people to come out of their homes and go back into the cinema to see uh, like the Avengers of Spider-Man movies and that's something that undoubtedly is a huge part of its legacy. Even if the movie is unsuccessful in so many other ways, which it isn't, I don't think, but even if the movie wasn't successful in certain ways, I think this just being as nostalgic in some ways, bringing them all together, uh, it's a, it's definitely a, a huge deal. And just getting everything together, this is a movie where you have Alfred Molina uh, being de-aged, uh, having his mechanical tentacles uh, be created through CGI, not through puppetry like in 2004 Spider-Man. Uh, you have Willem Dafoe, they're trying to keep him a secret, even on the set with a cloak covering his costume and to the point where Tom Holland accidentally bumped into Dafoe while cloaked and that's how the two of them met on set. And, I, you know, I, I, I forgot about this, Brian, and I, I totally forgot about the, the, the deal that Disney and Sony had to cut for Spider-Man to even be a, still a part of the MCU as uh, Sony and, and Disney had a little bit of a tiff over the character and just to get this movie kind of remaining in the MCU uh, meant that a deal had to be cut and Tom Holland apparently is uh, still a part of the MCU uh, apparently contractually obligated to appear in another Marvel movie at some point. We'll see if that happens uh, because of the dual strikes that are going on. We'll see when that all develops. And Tom Holland seems a little burnt out on acting, especially given how poorly received his Apple Plus show was. So uh, a lot going on, Brian, but a lot of secrecy, a lot of negotiations. Uh, any any response to those uh, to those points? Yeah, I remember that summer where uh, Spider-Man uh, Far From Home came out and then all that, you know, post, you know, contractual stuff happened. Uh, you know, it made, it made it seem like there wasn't going to be another Spider-Man uh, MCU connected movie and that Sony was going to do their own thing. And then I heard some people were saying, oh, you know, Sony, do, you know, they're just doing what they, you know, getting their cut and that's what they deserve and blah, blah, blah. And I get that. But the main thing was like, was the audience going to buy into the fact that you're going to have a new Spider-Man universe separate from the MCU when you set this, all this up. So, again, you're messing with your own continuity. And I was like, they're no way going to do this. They're going to find a deal. And, of course, we heard the stories about, you know, Tom Hall like, getting on the phone with the heads of both companies and asking and begging them to come together on a deal and whether or not that's just, you know, like a whole Colgan, you know, folklore kind of tale. You know what I mean? Just, just to get the public on your side and look like the real hero to the people. I don't know if that's true or not, but I think it's a great story. So, you know what I mean? But I thought the negotiations were just going to happen no matter what. And uh, yeah, With a two-picture deal, you know, people speculate, you know, Fantastic Four. Of course, we heard the announcement of Secret Wars. I think Secret Wars is probably the better choice, but uh, we'll see. Because uh, they they got to do a whole separate Spider-Man movie before that first, I think, to establish that. And uh, the way this ends, of course, I think they, you know, set that up pretty fine. That he can have his own story that can cross over later on, even though it's still part of the MCU he could still have like his own grounded kind of story separate from everyone else. This is the first MCU trilogy to have the same director as John Watts directed all three Spider-Man movies. Since then, we've had James Gunn complete his trilogy with Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, but it is, it's pretty amazing to think 
that we had three Spider-Man movies basically in the span of about four years uh, with them releasing every two years. And John Watts directed them all and basically decided he needed a break uh, just because of the intensity involved. And I'm sure directing this movie, especially during the worst parts of the pandemic, certainly uh, burned him out. There was originally a different script uh, for this one, as apparently there may have been uh, some additional use of the scrolls captain marvel based on what was hinted at at the end of far from home and eventually uh that was shifted to secret invasion uh the disney plus show that nobody's watching uh completely new script was written after the deal was made between sony and disney uh, where they would be focusing on the multiverse and certainly the multiverse has created uh some interesting uh discourse and uh has created a lot of uh, strife with Disney and Marvel just in terms of there being so many projects. It was also around this time that Tom Holland and Zendaya started dating and all three of the Spider-Man dated their female co-stars, Tobey Maguire, Kirsten Dunst, Andrew Garfield, and Emma Stone, and of course Tom Holland and Zendaya. So just funny how that all works, that the Spider-Man and their Mary Janes all, or Gwen Stacy, I guess, in the case of Emma Stone, uh, they all eventually started dating each other. So that's fun. In terms of box office, uh, this movie made $1.6 billion in the first 11 days. It completely dominated the Christmas season. And uh, unfortunately, the Matrix movie that came out around the same time was kind of forgotten. Go back into the archives and listen to us talk about that in Underrated Sequel Month. This earned $100 million its opening weekend. The first film in almost two years, the first of the COVID era to do as such. So, indeed, this was a big deal. And, of course, there have been a few movies that have had $100 million openings as well, including Barbie and Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, but it is uh, it is notable just how few uh, there have been. So any thoughts on the box office before we get uh, back into the categories, which we'll have to review. We'll, I'll review them as we go, but it's going to be interesting. I think that just goes, just goes to show you how Tobey Maguire. OK, yeah, Andrew Garfield, but I think more so Tobey Maguire is such an iconic superhero for my generation and I would even say part of, you know, the younger generation, too, because you're streaming those movies now all over the place. And you see, you know, Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man. And then I'm sure the kids have the same reaction as the adults did, you know, taking their kids to the movie. So I think there's something to that. And I think Tobey Maguire doesn't get a lot of the credit for the draw of this movie. Um, even if you just had Andrew Garfield, I think it would have still done well. But the fact that Tobey was in it, you know, I think that's what put it over the top, to be honest. And uh, I think you should get a lot more credit. And... Uh, Brian, do you realize how much The Amazing Spider-Man made? Do you want to know the box office? Take a guess. Amazing worldwide or domestic? Worldwide or domestic? Let's let's talk total. Do- let's talk total box office. I want to say six hundred million worldwide. Seven hundred and fifty-eight million dollars. So, look, the second one admittedly did not do nearly as well, either critically or box office wise. But that first Amazing Spider-Man definitely made a lot more money than you or I probably think. So I, I think we're, we might be underestimating Andrew Garfield a little bit. Well, remember I mentioned with those big pops between uh, in the crowd, like the ladies were screaming for Andrew Garfield and the men were screaming for Toby. So there's kind of that divide there. I get it. And of course, you know, the, the ladies are going to go with the pretty boy, but there's that legacy, you know what I mean? And I think there's something to that. And the fact that it was what, you know, 20 years almost, So, you know, imagine Christopher, you know, Reeves coming back if he never had the accident kind of thing. That's what everyone, like what Michael Keaton did, but not in a Flash movie, obviously, but in a Batman movie. Then you would have a draw. But um, in this case, it's like perfect because it was in a Spider-Man movie. Uh, Christopher Reeves, if if not for the accident, uh, can you imagine how much money he would have made appearing in movies as Superman? Like, just all the millions of dollars he would have made. So it's, uh, he, it's he would have had the natural question. white hair to do it too. Yeah. Uh, it just, it sucks, man. It really sucks, but I digress. Let's go to our categories. The first of which is the hero category for me, Brian. I think that Tom Holland has been very consistent. I think this is a movie with a lot of characters, a lot of returning characters. I think Tom Holland does a really good job of, 
sticking out. And I think that Tom Holland has always done a really good job in these movies. And even if I'm not, even though Far From Home is not my favorite of the Spider-Man movies that I think has a significant amount of problems, I think Tom Holland is still really good. I think the work that he did in Infinity War, and Infinity War is a movie that I think has some really good performances, but Tom Holland has to be like top two or three, just, and especially with the ending uh, with Tony Stark, like Tony, Tom Holland is so, so good in this. And as much as, as great as it was to see the old characters back in so many cases, the fact that Tom Holland still continues to be the rock solid center Spider-Man, I really, I, I really like this performance. I really like him. And I just wish he would stop trying to be, like he does these like really weird projects like Cherry and the crowded room where he's like trying to be either a bad boy or like a criminal or going to a dark place. Like, man, he needs to do some romantic comedies or something. Like this he is so good as this as this character that I almost wish not to say that he should just stay in his lane, but he should do a lot more fun things and stop doing the crowded room because boy oh boy is that show bad. Didn't watch it, but I did watch Uncharted, which, you know, he was fun in that. And that's kind of what he should be kind of be doing. So uh, I get entirely what you're saying. He doesn't want to be typecast, so that's kind of his decision. And I get that. He struggles with that from what I read. So it's on him ultimately. But um, in the end, um, I guess when you're younger, you want to be, you know, you want to do things with more meaning. I get it. Kind of been there myself. So but as you grow older, you know. You kind of start seeing the big picture in, in the long term, and maybe you should do certain things now in order to make money for the long term later. So maybe he'll start to realize that and become like that mid 40s rom com star that some uh, people did in the 90s and the 2000s. So you never know. But in terms of the heroes of this movie, uh, I'm very high on them. You know what I mean? Like uh, even from the beginning, when this idea that Peter doesn't give up on uh, the villains, even though he doesn't really know these villains personally, but he just sees them as people with problems that need help and that to me there's like one of those ultimate core peter parker spider-man things you know what i mean it's like uh that's one of his true character um one of the things that's true to his character he's always trying to help people no matter what and he doesn't give up on people and i think that's one uh one of those things that uh you should emphasize in the spider-man movie and they really did that well here and uh the fact that he doesn't give up on like a, a, the green, the goblin, you know what I mean? Despite the fact that the audience knows how evil of a son of a bitch he is, and then the fact that Tobey Maguire comes back and still is willing to help him help the Green Goblin, despite he knowing all the evil that he's done and the murders that he's done. So there's something to that where the Spider Men are still willing to try to help these people despite knowing their fate. Uh, you know, I guess they knowingly are making multiverses so to speak, I guess, because there's no other way of putting it. So, But again, that's more that confusing plot stuff later. But uh, in this case, I think the three of them coming together and trying to help the villains that they fought before is, you know, it's kind of powerful stuff. You know, the whole second chance stuff is really powerful stuff. And you almost get that a full turn uh, with Goblin. But, uh, you know, we'll talk about that in the villains. But uh, the fact that they went out of their way to try to help them um, still, um, I think, speaks a lot. And then Aunt May, ugh. It sucks that she died, I mean, you know, and I know we, what you're going to say. We have to have that conversation, because it's 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 a problem. Like, at this point, the the, the amount of times that Marvel has fridged your female characters, I think it is a problem. And I think it's been a consistent problem from the beginning, but you just, it, it happens in Infinity War with Gamora. It happens in Endgame with Black Widow. It happens in this movie with Aunt May. It happens in Black Panther uh, with Angela Bissett. It's just, and spoilers for Secret Invasion, it may or may not happen to Maria Hill. I mean, it's still to be determined. We are recording this before the last episode is aired. It just, I don't know, man. I think it's a huge problem. And I understand, I understand what they're going for. They're going for the Uncle Ben moment. Like, Aunt May is the one that basically is the one that puts forth the idea of with a great power comes great responsibility. So I understand what they're doing. But I don't know, man, it just it really rubs me the wrong way that consistently the way that Marvel continues to treat their female characters, I think it's a problem and it's definitely a black mark against this movie. And it's kind of a black mark against Marvel in general. And 
I don't know, man. I think it's I think it has really hurt the movies. I think Guardians of the Galaxy was hurt by the fact that Gamora is not really a part of the team. I think that I think that hurt the, that movie, and I think this it's it's definitely not as bad. But again, these Marvel movies have become so weird in terms of what they're trying to do tone wise, pacing wise, and I think this is another big example. To me, when I saw this the first time, it didn't really like bother me as much just because we had previously seen the animated Spider-Verse movie, right? And in that one, would you say they fridged his uncle? I mean, you you you're it's it's different when you're when there's a male character. Um you're not the the rules are just different and I think that in terms of the the family trauma, the argument that I would make is that we don't necessarily I mean, because that that wasn't an Uncle Ben. So I mean, the situation is just very different. It's it's more about the treatment of female characters in general. So I don't. I mean, can you free a free a male character? Maybe I, I I haven't read enough to know like what that's like, but I I think it's it, it's it's very different to me. I think the approach of the Spider Verse movies overall is very different because you have the presence of a, of the Gwen Stacy character. And I think that makes a difference. And there's so many female characters in the spider verse that, and they haven't, they haven't resorted to the fridging and even like the main conflict of the spider verse sequels is going to be the, the potential death of miles Morales, father, not his mother. So it's just a different dynamic altogether. I think in terms of just I think I think Spider Verse has a lot more interesting things to say about the death of the family members. This just feels like okay, we're, these three movies plus the Avengers have really just been an extended origin story for Spider Man. That's what it is to me. Because when I saw it the first time, I was like, okay, because based on what they're trying to do, they're trying to change the expectations of the whole Uncle Ben thing. So since there's no Uncle Ben in this universe. Of course, it's going to be Aunt May, and that's the first time we've seen Aunt May in that, you know, actually die like that. So to me, it was like something fresh and new in terms of like mixing up the Spider-Man lore. Not necessarily let's go do the do the fridging route. Um, it just kind of turned out that way because there is no Uncle Ben. So that's kind of what I was interpreting, and just based on what I had seen in the previous animated Spider-Man movies, I was like, oh, okay, since they did it with, you know... The Prowler in that one, they're kind of switching things up every time we see this new iteration of a Spider-Man. It's not always going to be Uncle Ben. It's going to be someone different in that role. And in this case, it just happened to be Marissa Tomei's May. So to me, it was fine. Because at this point, there's not much you can do with that character anyway. When is she going to come back? Six, seven years later in her role. So at this point, you know, makes, it makes sense um, to Peter's alone. And he's alone at the end of the movie. And that's what it's going to be a struggle that he's got no one to, to kind of look up to. You know what I mean? And uh, that's what other franchises kind of do sometimes with their characters, and that's what they wanted to do with this one, and that's kind of what they were setting up for whatever future Peter Parker has. So him being alone makes sense to me, and, I mean, unfortunately, um, May dies, but, I mean, it's not necessarily, like, a thing that I saw was, like, an insult to the character. It was more so, okay, this is... She had, her, you know, her time, her three movies. She kind of had her arc herself, and uh, that's kind of it for her, and I'm, I accepted it. On an individual level, Aunt May's death is not a problem. But when you look at the totality of what Marvel has done, that to me is when it becomes a problem. I see your point, but uh, to me, it didn't just, you know, it didn't affect me that way. And I just didn't think much of it in terms of the bigger picture like that. I just saw it as like for this story, this is making sense to me. And I just, you know, I was like, okay, my mind's done. Uh, Zendaya and Ned, unfortunately, MJ and Ned, they kind of get sidelined. Ned does get the big moment where. He, he, he may or may not uh, be associated with Wong in the future uh, because of what he can do, but he is the one that is responsible uh, for bringing the amazing Spider-Man and the original Spider-Man into the, the, the MCU universe, uh, so to speak. And uh, yeah, MK gets a couple good lines, but again, both of these characters... Uh, they're very much sidelined because there's there's all the, the all this other stuff going on. I don't know. I, I don't really have a lot to say about them. Like I was I was really hoping to rewatch this and be like, okay, I, I was to really try to focus on MJ especially because uh, Zendaya is a really good talent, and it just it just feels like they they have they have no idea. I don't think they know what they have in Zendaya as a performer. 
because I think when you look at the work that she's done in Euphoria, which is not a great show, but her performance in it is really good. And even what she's done in some other movies, it just, it really feels like they don't know what to do with Zendaya's MK besides give her a couple like snarky lines. And that sucks. Yeah, I get you. Uh, but they did have their small moments. I, I love that moment with them at, at the Lola's house. Uh, God, that was so good because it's, you know, because I'm Filipino and they're speaking Tagalog and all that stuff. And, you know, there's, there's stuff in Filipino culture where, like, I don't know, there's stuff about black magic and, you know, there's, like, a very mystical kind of thing with the Christianity that goes on. Uh, kind of similar to the, to the Mexican culture in terms of that, you know, mysticism with Catholicism. And for some reason, I don't know why, when I saw Ned do the magic, I was like, okay, he's one of those, like, Filipino, like, you know, like, magical, you know, like, things from, like, the lore, you know what I mean? Like, some kind of sorcerer or something. But uh, to me, that that for some reason, I just thought of, like, when my mom would tell me these stories as a kid, you know what I mean? About, like, dark magic and, like, gnomes and shit in the Philippines and, like, all these weird things of the supernatural type. And seeing this... Uh, you know what I mean? The Lola in the background, I was just like, God, this feels like very like on point for, for Ned to somehow be some magical kind of character based on like the Filipino lore that I've heard as a kid. So I don't know. It was just, it just made sense in a weird way. And I don't know if they were going for that consciously, but subconsciously for a, a kid like me. And if you hear all those stories growing up, uh, from the Philippines, you know, like there's some magical shit out there in the Philippines that people believe and buy into. So for this to happen to a Filipino character on screen, that was pretty cool. So um, in terms of Ned getting that little thing and being able to, able to control it somewhat towards the end, uh, you know, hopefully they bring Ned in into a future Doctor Strange movie. Um, of course, they didn't really think about that in, in, in terms of the continuity when they were filming the Doctor Strange movie right after this. But um, I think there's some stories there. You can Even him to Wong would be amazing for some shorts. Well, on the Brian, if you remember, Doctor Strange was originally supposed to come out before spider-man i remember but they retconned it in that beginning diner scene so uh either way like give me wong and ned together because i think that's a great dynamic of, of a student teacher thing right there throw in dr strange every once in a while but ned is that sorcerer's apprentice deal like i think that works a lot for the smaller kind of story arcs you want to tell um i think they set that up great in this one all right let's talk about uh i think the Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire of this movie. I think it works perfectly. I think their returns, uh, I think they really earned it well. And I'm especially happy for Andrew Garfield because I think the Amazing Spider-Man movies justifiably uh, are not uh, treated with a lot of reverence, but it really feels like he especially got redeemed. Tobey Maguire, I think to an extent, gets it a little bit too because Spider-Man 3 was not a great finish to the Spider-Man trilogy. So it's great to see him kind of get a lot of great moments uh, with Willem Dafoe, especially like that's the person that he interacts with the most on the villain side. So I think the Andrew Garfield, I mean, especially the moment uh, when he saves MJ, I mean, that, I mean, people applauded after that. And I was, I was a bit taken aback because I didn't, I didn't know if people would remember Amazing Spider-Man 2. Either people had seen it and remember it, or they intuited what had happened like through pop culture and through YouTube videos, and they figured it out. But there was definitely applause after that. And uh, it's a great acting moment. And yeah, it's probably it's one of my favorite moments in the movie, uh, is Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man saving MJ. It's, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say. And, uh, yeah, Tobey Maguire, also really solid uh, in his role. And, yeah, I, I don't really, I, I was a little bit negative on Aunt Mays and De MJ and Ned, but you could not have done a better job in terms of the three Spider-Men together. I mean, they did the meme. They had the conversation about what I, I've been arguing about with people about whether or not the spider web should be natural versus a web shooter. Apparently, more people love the web shooter. But to me, like, I guess because I love the Tobey Maguire movie so much that it should it should be from just him because then he never has to run out. And they even had that exact discussion about running out, which he's like, oh, man, that sucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm like, yeah, it sucks. He's going to have to fill up every time. So, yeah, that whole discussion, like, where does it come from? Is it only just from your arms? That whole that whole discussion there. And then, of course, the meta commentary about Tobey Maguire's back, which I thought was 
I felt like I was one of the few people laughing at it in the theater because I knew exactly what they were talking about based on the uh, be- the between Spider-Man 1 and 2 filming about him and his back issues, giving him that chiropractor pop, which, you know, I love watching chiropractor videos to help me go to sleep at night. So seeing that, of course, pop me uh, in a metaphorical sense. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just that dynamic really works. And we forget about Doctor Strange and only because he was literally put in the mirror realm or whatever upside down. Brian, for I watched this movie the night before putting the notes together and I almost forgot to include Doctor Strange. That's how forgettable he is in this movie. And I want to point out that he's the one that fixes things at the end and is a prominent part of making of creating the chaos at the beginning. So that 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 should tell you a lot about what I think about Doctor Str- about Doctor Strange's presence in this movie. It's too many to characters. Be, to be honest, I think, you know, okay, this is just me being, I don't know, maybe digging too much into it. But the moment he tells Peter, how come you didn't call the college office department and, you know, call him about why he didn't get accepted? And I was like, you can do that? And then it just it occurred to me and it dawned on me, it's because he has white privilege. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So I thought that's what was the point. I don't know if anyone else picked up on it in the theater. But when that moment happened, I was like, dude, you can't do that. And then, of course, the reason that, you know, those three don't think of it is because they're, you know, well, Peter's not a minority, obviously, but he comes from obviously lower class. He's, you know, pawning shit off like Legos for trips and shit like that. Uh, and you got to the other two minority characters. So it was clearly like, oh, Dr. Strange is like, you know, he has this white privilege that he hasn't quite shaken off yet or will he ever shake off? But I thought that was a nice little, you know, commentary on the character that not a lot of people picked up on, but I picked up on it. You know, because I was like, you can't just fucking call and challenge the fact that you didn't get accepted to a college. Unless, of course, you come from an affluent background like Dr. Strange does and can just challenge any decision, I guess. Yeah, um, Avengers and the economic realities of being a superhero is definitely something that Phase 4 has had, has tried to touch on and uh, has done so to a mixed effect, I would say. Uh, But in terms of my score... Uh, despite some of my uh, negativity, I'm still giving this a nine. Uh, I'm going with a ten just because those conversations between the three Spider-Men were very like deep and like moving. And the fact that like, you know, let's face it, I was one of those people that shit on the Andrew Garfield movies and I wasn't too kind to them. So when when, of course, Toby goes, dude, no one hates you, man. You're amazing. And I was like, oh, he's talking to me. Now I feel bad. So so it maybe do a 180 on, on Andrew Garfield. Like, I can't hold it against him that he had bad scripts to work with, you know what I mean? But he did a good job as Spider-Man, I guess. So so for, to me, like, those meta conversations really, you know, turned the tables on some characters for me. And that I guess that also made that day a moment even better when she caught him, or when he caught her. So overall, I got to go with a 10 because I think certain moments that are just going to stick with me in terms of cinematically, a lot from that, you know, that Statue of Liberty scene for sure. All right, let's talk about the villains. Basically, all of the villains return in some form or fashion, except for James Franco, and uh, he was not missed. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, in my view, I think Willem Dafoe's performance is extremely underrated in terms of like if you're putting him against like other MCU villains, because I just think that what he does here is just on a different level from so many of the other villains because like there's part of it that is about redemption, but he does still does a kind of a heel turn. And really the only other villain of note that gets a lot to do is of course, Alfred Molina's Doc Ock. And I think he does a really good job as well. I think those are the two main villain performances. Like Jamie Foxx is there. Uh, It's less racist this time. So that's good. Uh, Sandman is around in CPI. That's okay. That's great. Uh, I I forgot to put the lizard in here, but the lizard is also there. And uh, if I were to, t- do you remember the plot of Amazing Spider-Man? It was just basically the original, like, first episode of the '90s series, pretty much. It right? was the lizard trying to turn New York yeah. into all lizards. Oh, so they combined <laughs> two of the plots from the one from like season three or four. Remember yes. that? Yes. Oh, um, like, yeah. So. It, for my money, you know, it was cool to see the villains, but, like, for me, it's about Willem Dafoe and Alfred Molina. Like, the movie is so much centered around them, and I think they get a lot more to do than the others. I think their performances are top-notch. And, yeah, that's really all I have to say about the villains. I give this a 9. I'm going with an 8 because I just thought that, 
I mean, I guess it's because of the COVID situation and they couldn't get um, Reese Evans and uh, uh, Thomas Hayden Church, right? The, they didn't actually come back. I don't know if you knew that, but they never came back for any actual new footage. It was all B-roll from Correct. the previous movies. Yeah, I so, mean, I sort is, of figured that. So, which is, to me, it's like, it's cool that they came back, but they never got individual moments to kind of set them in the current time frame. They were just literally, literally in the background, you know what I mean? Which sucked, but... Visually, it was cool when they were on the elevator. I think that's one of those more iconic visuals from this movie of them going up the elevator to Happy's apartment. All of them with the with their powers and the way they look. Um, and then, you know, of course, Willem Dafoe, I think. Um, you, you talk about underrated. I think, I th- honestly, I think the best moment he did in this movie is not him being like crazy Green Goblin. I think it's him in the homeless shelter when he's acting like like a real homeless person and like doing the things that a real homeless person would do about like taking the extra donuts and putting in the pockets. Remember that? Like I felt that was so authentic to what that character was going through at that moment. And uh, I thought, wow, he's really like doing some things that a lot of actors would not go out of the way to do like the little things to kind of fit what the character's going through. Cause at that moment, you know, Green Goblin doesn't know he's Green Goblin. He's going through that mental thing because of going through between the universe is screwed with his head, especially having, I think he hit his head like right after that. So uh, he was going through some stuff and, you know, and then the turn happens and, and all that stuff. But I think he is an underrated performance. And of course you go to Afro Molina, who just, to me, he was like, what, one of the big reasons I was really wanted to watch this movie of him coming back and getting that redemption moment that I thought he deserved. And, I finally got what I wanted, Jerome. So this made this moment made me happy when he turned at the end. Uh, just tremendous stuff, and of course him having that moment with Peter, having that goodbye was great. So when they announced them, like two, three, I guess it was two years before the movie came out at this point, maybe a year. Well, Alfred Molina basically said that he was in the movie, which probably got him in some trouble. But I don't think. But he- actually, I think it got more buzz for the movie because I remember a lot of people were more like, "Oh, does this mean blah blah blah." And, of course, it spread, and I think that's what actually I, I would make the argument that it was a good idea because you basically got to advertise the other – you basically got to advertise Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield returning without having to do so. Like, just having the villains – it was enough to have the villains be announced and get people excited. That's what I would say. And, yeah, of course, like, you know, J.K. Simmons. J.K. Simmons, it's basically a cameo. He doesn't get a lot to do. Like, it makes sense, but, again, he's not – He's not really a prominent part and doesn't really get any good lines. And it's it's strange seeing him as a field reporter. It's just you're never used to seeing him like that. But I guess and if he's independent, he's got to be doing everything himself, it looks like. Right. So based on what we've seen, he's doing his own green screen editing and I guess field reporting as well. So, yeah, this version of J. Jonah Jameson is a go getter, I guess. But I guess that's what you have to be in, like a cynical world like, you know, the, the universe that he's in. So, uh, yeah, overall, I give it an eight. I just feel like they shortchanged some of the other uh characters they just brought him in for you know the nostalgia but not giving him any moments which sucks because you gave these other villains moments in time but they didn't do that for the lizard uh electro um well jamie fox kind of had some moments i think that line about a black spider-man was amazing uh one of the more memorable lines in the movie and uh you know wouldn't he know it you know that miles morales was out there so absolutely let's talk about the story again this story is just there's a lot to it. I mean, this is a movie that's two and a half hours and has kind of fallen prey to so to so many summer blockbusters and, and big movies where they, they really feel the desire to get to this two and a half, if not longer, mark. And again, I think there's a lot of really good stuff throughout the story. Some of the major beats include uh, Peter, MK, and Ned being rejected by MIT. Uh, Peter going to the New York Sanctum to ask Stephen Strange for help. Uh, Strange casts a spell that would have everybody forget Parker is Spider-Man, uh, but it's corrupted when Parker repeatedly requests alterations, and this is what basically causes the multiverse. We are f- we first see Otto Octavius, uh, then we see some of the other villains after a battle between Spider-Man as well as uh, Doc Ock, and eventually they put all of them in prison. Uh, Doctor Strange wants to send them back to their universes to meet their fates, basically means getting killed. Uh, but of course, Spider-Man decides that is not what he wants to do, and he wants to give them the chance to redeem themselves uh, and traps Doctor Strange in a mirror dimension. Uh, all hell breaks loose, and May dies. We get the return of both Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, Spider-Man. Uh, we have a big confrontation at the Statue of Liberty. Doctor Strange is able to get out 
of his situation and eventually with things coming to a head at the end, uh, Spider-Man, Tom Holland Spider-Man decides that he is going to sacrifice himself, that he is going to have everybody forget that Peter Parker is Spider-Man and that ultimately everybody is going to even forget who Peter Parker is. And that's what happens. So he is all alone studying for the GED in a shitty New York apartment. And that is where we leave Spider-Man. Uh, Brian, are there any major story points that you really want to dive into and address? I mean, let's face it, the beginning was rushed, right? Like, it, they could have done a lot more to kind of, kind of, you know, let that... I mean, that I literally did mention that Daredevil made his MCU debut in this movie. I know, I know. And I felt like it was just so rushed, those first 20 minutes, 30 minutes, but... I still forgave him for because I, I was just looking at this like, God, there's a lot that they have to transition to from the whole Mysterio thing. And they kind of just glossed over the, the the lawyer stuff and the case and all those kind of things. And there's, I mean, you could have done like almost like a whole hour on just the whole legal court thing and all that kind of thing. Because, you know, court dramas, you know, kind of work in a sense if you do it right. And when you got when you got Daredevil in there as an actual lawyer and he's actually good as the, you know, the Matt Murdock part, not just the Daredevil part. You could have played around with that, and they didn't really do that. And they, I felt like they wasted Matt Murdock, but, you know, at the same time, it was cool because, you know, I was the first one to realize this, apparently, that John Favreau is the only person to work on screen with both Daredevils on screen as Daredevil. So that's pretty cool. And uh, they had the brick scene, which is fine, but I thought, you know, they could have done a lot more in the first 30 minutes and it was rushed. Uh, other than that, you know, multiverse stuff is always going to be wacky and makes no sense. So at this point, I'm kind of just accepting it because, like, the whole thing about, you know, it's the people that knew who Spider-Man was. And I don't think at any point Electro knew who Spider-Man was is their, their true identity. So they kind of just ret retconned that and shoehorned that in and, of course, changed his color. But uh, other than that, you know what I mean? I think for what the story was telling and the way they got there to get the three Spider-Men together worked. So seven out of ten for me. I am also going to give this a 7 out of 10. I think there's a lot of elements that work. In some ways, I think that the second in beginning of the third act is some of the strongest stuff in the movie. And I think that's where the movie really sings, is I think when you get some of the villains together and interacting with each other, I think that's really fun. And when the Spider-Men themselves are interacting. I think the third act itself, and we can get into this with the visuals, like I think... There are some fun moments, but I, this is clearly a COVID compromised movie. Uh, there's a lot of empty, empty, a lot of empty spaces. There's a lot of moments where it feels like people are not in the same room with one another, and I think that this very much feels like a typical modern Marvel movie. And everything is CGI to death, a lot of volume, a lot of a lot of green screen, and I think it's unfortunate because. I think what ends up happening is that you lose the tactile feel. And I, I you know, I want to point out in in a week, in a weekend or in a month, July 2023, where I saw a Mission Impossible movie and I saw Oppenheimer, like you just feel like these are real people in a real place. That makes such a difference. It really, really makes a difference. And then you know, you watch something like this where it's very clear that they are not in real locations in a lot of ways. And it just stinks, man. Like, it really stinks that this is kind of what the MCU has become. And I, this is something that I think they're going to have to seriously uh, reevaluate at some point, given the box office and rating challenge, ratings challenges that they have experienced. Um, so for me, the visuals of this movie are, are just, like, adequate. And I am going to give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt because of COVID, but I am still giving the visual score a six. I'm a little bit higher. I mean, I, I guess I'm way higher because to me, it was the standard Marvel. I, I would say like the Marvel standard, right? And I would say the below standard would be kind of like, I see what you're talking about. Like we talked about that with Thor Love and Thunder, where it felt like it was the whole COVID thing of people not being in the same room and putting him in the same scene together, you know, cutting and pasting. I think it's even worse than Thor Love and Thunder. My visual score for Thor Love and Thunder would probably be a three or four. So for me, like, I thought they they covered it up at the end really well. And I'm going to talk about the, the Statue of Liberty scene specifically, because to me, 
when we had our top 10 action sequences of all time and in, in the superhero movies, when we had that discussion last year. I was going to put this on, but because of the recency bias, I was elected not to. And it was going to be like my number nine, I think, or something like that. I really love that sequence. And yes, it's dark and I've criticized dark, you know, darkness and the CGI before. But the fact that they had this lightning thing going on and I noticed that like, you know, in the trailer. And then when I'm watching this multiple times, I've seen that ending multiple times already, like five or six times. And I just enjoy it so much. And I don't know if it's just because of the dialogue or the fact that you got that flashing yellow light lightning in the background, just constantly pulsating. Uh, and there's just the fact that it's like, I don't know, because it's just like a skyscraper effect and they're going through the multiple layers and you got the actual skyscraper there. That kind of, that's what, you know, that's a real skyscraper they built on top of the green screen. So that for me levels out the whole, like, you know, like fooling yourself into thinking what's real and what's not and the blending of together, you know what I mean? The seamlessness. So for me that worked, especially when they had that conversation, uh, on top of the Statue of Liberty, I think that kind of made my mind just, you know, this feels like a normal background. You know what I mean? It didn't feel like CGI, even though a lot of it was. But when they had that conversation, my mind didn't go through that. So there's something about that Statue of Liberty scene that really just sticks with me. And I love that scene a lot. And I don't know if it's just the emotions going through it. I don't know if it's the MJ catch moment. I don't know if it's just the big emotional ending with Tobey Maguire and Green Goblin and then him getting stabbed. But something about it, man. So I'm giving it a 9 out of 10 because just because that that one Statue of Liberty sequence, man, just sticks with me. And there was hype about that sequence going into the movie and coming out of it. I was like, man, that's that's one of my favorite sequences I've seen in the MCU to date. And maybe in, in fact, it was top 10 of all time in all my superhero movies. So, um, yeah, it's still in my top 10 of uh, favorite action sequences in superhero movies. All right, uh, so let's get to the legacy of this movie. So this is maybe one of the last important and possibly great Marvel movies to be made. I think we could certainly have a conversation about Guardians of the Galaxy at some point. Uh, Volume 3, I think we are going to do so. I think the MCU has very much been a mixed bag with the writers and actors strike going on. Who knows when we're going to see... Deadpool 3 and the Avengers movies and all of the other Marvel projects. This feels like it's something important, and I don't know how many other important MCU projects we're going to be getting in the next few years. I also want to mention that, you know, this is the first truly successful movie of the COVID era. That obviously is important when you think about box office and bringing people back into the movie theater. Uh, this brings back, you know, three of the Spider-Men uh, together, and I think that's important. Uh, so I think from a positive, I think that there are a lot of positive legacy points, and in factoring my score, that's really the only evaluation that I'm going to make. Um, I will let you talk about some of the positives that you have to say, and I'm going to get into some of the some of the negatives, but I want to be clear that these negatives are not the fault of the movie. Uh, but they are kind of the fault of uh, the the poor lessons that have been learned. But for me, uh, the legacy is probably the strongest aspect of this movie, just because of all the characters that were brought together, the COVID of it all, and just bringing people together into the movie theater for the first time ever, and really this turning into kind of a celebration of the character. Yeah, I'm never going to forget that night when I saw it. That audience was tremendous. The reactions, I mean, you can go on YouTube right now and still see those reactions from the different theaters across the country and just feel that emotion. So to me, that's that's the uh, the cherry on top for me. Uh, it's it's a 10 out of 10 just because, I mean, yeah, you talk about the, bringing the actors back and you mentioned the box office and all these different things. But there are going to be certain moments in time that I'm not going to like I'm going to remember with me when it comes to like these fictional heroes and like Spider-Man. You know, like I've mentioned this numerous times, Tobey Maguire is for a lot of people my age is like our Christopher Reeves and for that moment to happen, just incredible stuff. So to me, 10 out of 10, uh, even with like, uh, I would say the, ant I don't know, just the fact that the whole uh, Alfred Molina thing happened just as a lesson in marketing, I think within itself, I don't know if it's an anomaly. I don't know if it's a lesson to be learned, but the fact that you advertise a guy that's tied to the legacy characters, which makes the audience think the legacy characters are coming back means you don't have to necessarily don't necessarily have to advertise those legacy characters coming back and they didn't have to it still made all the money. So are there lessons to be learned? Yes, maybe. Was it just a one once in a lifetime thing? I don't know, but 
I think I don't know. We'll see with Secret and Secret Wars, whatever that Avengers movie coming out with all the different heroes coming together from different multiverses. Let's see how that does. If this is played out, I don't know, but this is maybe a one I, I think this is an issue. I mean, I think the legacy of the movie is a nine straight up. So we'll give our scores in a minute. But for me, I think that some of the wrong lessons have been taken away. I think that I, I look at the Flash movie and Brian and I have very different viewpoints on the Flash movie. But just from a purely objective number standpoint, the movie is uh, pretty much a disaster. And I think there are a lot of reasons for it to be a disaster. And there's a lot of movies this summer that, quite frankly, have not done financially well. A lot of sequels. Fast 10, Indiana Jones, Dial of Destiny. I think people are tired of seeing the same old sequels. I mean, we are on the fifth iteration of Indiana Jones. There's been 30 Marvel movies. There's been God knows how many DC movies. I think people are really hungering for something different. And I am very curious to see what happens with Deadpool 3. Because you have Hugh Jackman returning in the role of Wolverine. Logan was the perfect ending to that character. And there is nothing that he can do in Deadpool 3. Or if he eventually appears in an Avengers movie. That is actually, I think, going to be worth him worth him coming back and maybe you disagree but i don't know man i just feel like we are in a transitional period superhero movies were very much a huge factor in the first 20 years of the century and it is not that they are going to go away i think you're still going to see financially successful superhero movies just like with this year we've seen Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 be extremely successful. We have seen Spider-Man into the or across the Spider-Verse be very, very successful. But we've also seen Superman superhero movies bomb. The Flash is going to end up being one of the biggest bombs in the history of Warner Brothers as a movie studio. Ant-Man, Quantumania was a huge disappointment. The, the ratings for Secret Invasion are a, a huge disappointment given that that show cost 200 million dollars i think people are starting to be much more picky about the superhero movies that they're seeing and i think that if you are going to strictly rely on nostalgia as i think as i think marvel is really risking themselves by putting a lot of the x-men into deadpool 3 and possibly into an, an avengers movie I think we're playing with fire, and I don't know if that's going to be successful. I really don't. I mean, maybe I will be proven wrong, and Deadpool 3 is going to be really good, and maybe they really do have a great plan for Secret Wars, but a lot of what I've seen from Marvel in the last couple of years has been very, very shaky. A lot of what I've seen from DC has also been very, very shaky. And, again, I don't blame this movie. I don't think that affects the legacy score. But I am very, very skeptical about this, the, 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 the future of superhero movies unless things change drastically. That's a bit of a mixed bag for me because I feel like people have like weird expectations like the Ant-Man example. It's like, when was Ant-Man like a billion dollar franchise? It never was. But then why do people assume it's going to be this billion dollar hit? Well, Is it because I it's think Marvel? Specifically, Ant-Man and Quantumania was a big deal because it was the kickoff of Phase Five, and you had the official debut of Kang. I but see, the thing is, is like no one knows who Kang is, right? So where was this I expectation mean, but Jonathan, coming but from? Jonathan, but Jonathan Majors is is a, is a big deal. I think that was also a huge part of it. You know, there's some hype coming off call, coming off of Loki, and I don't necessarily I don't necessarily disagree with you that it needs to cost. I don't necessarily disagree with you the idea that it needs to be a billion that it needs to make a billion dollars. But the problem is the movie costs two hundred and fifty million dollars. Well, that's another problem. Is that that's the, I mean that's the biggest problem. There's other that, these, like these, these weird expectations, crazy. right? And financially, that I think where are these like expectations coming from necessarily? Like, okay, we talk about the Flash, right? The Flash is not that big of an IP. So where was this idea that it was going to be a billion? I was but never. It cost, it cost 290 million dollars. Exactly. So why why are we spending this money? A, where is this expectations coming from? And then all of a sudden, it seems like they're overhyping it just so they can, you know, tear down these movies easier. Because like, I don't know. I feel like something. Well, Warner. I I mean, The Flash. I think was a self inflicted wound. They had Tom Cruise coming out saying this is one of the best superhero movies of all time, and you have all these people. Okay, that's speaking a of Tom Cruise. Wound. Is we, we talk about Mission Impossible now. 
that seems to be doing way less than other Mission Impossible movies right now, right? So I mean, I think it's I don't know. I mean, Mission Impossible. So are we has picking never and been choosing? Is what a disaster? You see what I'm saying? Is like, are we picking and choosing what a disaster at the box office is nowadays too? That's another I mean, risk I think. I mean, Mission Impossible undoubtedly is a, is going to be a disappointment. I think the international numbers for Mission Impossible have been a little bit better. And I also think that Mission Impossible also is a better reviewed movie. So I think it is getting a little bit more to the benefit of the doubt. And I don't know if that's fair or not. But what I would say is that the I think another issue that Ant-Man and Flash both have is that the movies both look really terrible. I think that is also something that people can directly point to and say, like, immediately the first day The Flash was out on VOD, people were pointing out, like, the, some of the some of the CGI and how, and how janky it was. And I know the director has come out and, you know, he is, I appreciate the fact that the director of Flash came out and said that that was done purposefully. He's not throwing his uh, designers under the bus. I, you know, I have nothing against like defending the look of that movie as a director, because I would rather him support his staff than say the movie looks like shit. So I'm not going to throw the director under the bus, but objectively to me, the movies both look terrible. And if these movies are going to cost $250 million and if they're going to look like that, then you're also setting, uh, you're also setting yourself up to fail because people are going to make fun of that on social media because it's just really easy to. And I think the, the, and yes, mission impossible certainly could all it should also be considered uh, a box office disappointment, a huge box office disappointment. But I think that with Mission Impossible, the fact that the movie doesn't look like crap and it also has a more tactile feel to it, I think people are more willing to give it the benefit of the doubt. And again, I don't know if that's fair or not, but I think that's the reality. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at, where I'm just kind of like seeing these weird expectations just so we can have these negative clickbait articles you know what i mean and i get that you want clickbait articles and blah 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 controversy creates cash and i get all that hoopla but it's just it's turning me away from like reading online reviews nowadays and less so to watch online movie youtube reviews and just kind of skip it all together because it just seems like they're looking for a narrative instead of just give me a yes this is a good movie yes this is, or a bit no i don't like this movie uh, it's just weird to me that it's kind of evolved to this way, and it's kind of sad that I've seen some of my favorite YouTubers kind of go down this direction. So that's kind of where I'm at personally. That's where I'm kind of like, when did these expectations just, you know what I mean, blah, 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 and then all of a sudden a movie does like a Mission Impossible, yet it's like a double standard. Of course, there are double standards, obviously. I'm just pointing out that we're like into picking and choosing what we're calling a, a box office bomb nowadays. And I've noticed that from some reviewers who are just like, you know, ignoring certain things and calling things certain things and then ignoring the fact that some of their other favorite movies are under the same category. So that's where I'm well, at. It, uh, that. To me, the bottom line is like, why are we spending $300 million on all these movies at this point? Like, why does Indiana Jones cost $300 million? That is inexcusable for a movie to be that expensive, especially an Indiana Jones movie. Like, there's just no reason for it. And I could even talk about the Marvel movie, uh, the Marvel TV shows. Like, why do six episodes of Secret Invasion cost $200 million? That is absolutely insane in my mind for it to be that, to be that expensive. And you're setting these projects up to fail when you have that. And then you have a movie like Barbie, which makes, which only costs $100 million. And $100 million, certainly not inexpensive, but... When you have a movie that costs one hundred million dollars, really, it only has to make three hundred to four hundred, and with a with an IP like that, it's almost guaranteed to get its money back plus exponentially more. And now that movie is probably going to end up being one of the biggest movies of the year. So, I think it's just we have to reconsider where the budget is going to. And certainly, I want the writers, directors, and all the artists and the union people. I want them to get their money. I want them to get paid. But I, we also need to have a real discussion and a real conversation about where the money is going and why these movies are costing what they do and making sure the CGI artists are also getting paid reasonably so that these movies look good. I don't know, man. I think it's a, these are really interesting times, and I think you are about to see a major, major shift in box office because of the fact that so many of these movies... Are, are bombing and i would say transformers is in the same boat that's another movie that has been a financial disappointment and yeah it's it's rough out there i think 
we really need to be thinking about like who who's directing these movies what should we like mission impossible 8 probably should be the last one fast 11 probably should be the last one because i think people are really hungering for something different and the recent barbenheimer box office double smash i think that that shows it and yes oppenheimer is a biopic barbie is based off of ip but you also have two really good directors who know what they're doing and who told those stories really well so maybe we need to give the directors some power maybe but uh we'll see what happens with that warner brothers warner brothers christopher nolan relationship that I don't know. We'll see if that's on the bend or not, or is this Christopher Nolan going to be a universal guy from now on? But we'll see. But in terms of the final scores, I'm at 44, and you are at? Uh, I'm at 40. So, 84. So, we have done it. We have finally put a live-action Spider movie into the superhero pantheon. And uh, I think this this covers everyone. So, Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland all in the superhero pantheon in this movie. So, I think we we did good in that in that area. Well, Tom Holland was already in the Pantheon and the other three because of the Avengers. Because blah, of the blah, Avengers blah, blah. Movies, but, but this is his first, you know, under the title role, his first, you know, appearance in the Pantheon. And we'll see about his future movies coming up in the next five, six years. But uh, who knows? Because we've kind of, you know, I, you're burnt out on superhero movies. We pretty much covered most of them. So, again, this is like a special edition. We were going to come back to it. Uh, in the future at some point for some other entries. But, uh, yeah, with the, the limited number of superhero movies coming out and the fact that, you know, I don't even watch and Shazam 2. So. Yes, I am burned out, but let's be honest. If we had an episode about Ant-Man and Quantumania, or if we had an episode about The Flash, like, we would be saying the same things over and over again. I just don't think that's interesting. I don't think that's interesting podcasting to me. Like if 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 that that's that's the argument I would make against still doing the, uh, so many superhero pantheon episodes, and certainly like there are going to be special circumstances, and certainly we're going to come back and review like the animated Spider-Man movies. Like certainly I want to do that, but like we don't need to do an, an episode about Ant-Man: Quantum Mania because we're going to be saying the same things over and over again. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we're actually bringing something really special back right now, which we haven't done in God knows how long. Jerome, burning, are you questions. Ready for burning questions. I'm so ready for this, Jerome. All right, favorite villain performance. Let go. Yeah, I'll go with Green Goblin, man. Willem Dafoe. As much as I love Doc Ock, I think he's like like an eight out of ten in terms of performance for Anthony Molina. But I think you know, uh, Willem Dafoe is like a nine and a half out of ten in this movie. Yeah, I, I was I was hoping we would disagree, but yeah, I mean, I think it's Willem Dafoe, and I don't think it's really close. I think Alfred Molina is above average, but. Willem Dafoe is, is I think if of all the things that I noticed more during the rewatch, Willem Dafoe's performance really stuck out. I think when you watch this the first time, you're just trying to keep track of what's going on with the plot. You're marking out at, at Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire. But I think on this rewatch, Willem Dafoe's performance really stands out. Uh, Brian, when is Marvel going to stop fridging female characters? Uh, probably not, especially with the Deadpool three coming out and that whole joke and they might make a joke out of the joke and it might become a meta joke. So just prepare for that joke. Uh, Miranda Baccarin dying in Deadpool two is the worst thing that ever happened because I, I know that fridging was a thing before, but everybody learned what fridging was because of that. And boy, oh boy, is that, that is the legacy of Deadpool two at this point. Well, also the fact that the first uh, sign of what fridging was from a Green Lantern character, and of yeah, course we play Green, Green Lantern. Look, in my mind, this isn't going to happen until you have more female directors, more female writers, more female executive producers. That is what it is. At. That's when it's actually going to end. Until you have more female creative voices, this shit is going to continue to happen. All right. So our next three questions are all about the Spider-Man actors, Brian. Will Tobey Maguire play Spider-Man again? Uh, yeah, Secret Wars and then, I don't know, rumors of the Spider-Man 4 movie, I think. I think at this point, there's more likely of an Andrew Garfield return to a franchise. I don't I don't think Tobey Maguire is going to come back. I think, I think this was his farewell. I think this was his goodbye. Is there a chance he does a cameo in Secret Wars? Yes. I wouldn't bet on it, though. I mean, at this point, 
<laughs> given the strikes, he may be about 50 years old. Is he really even gonna, even for a cameo going to want to come back and play this character? I don't know. It's it feels like it was a struggle to get him to come back for this one. So I I think we've seen the last. I'll one. I'll just say this: we said the same things about Sting in 2016. Yeah, but Sting is Sting's never. He just that. needs the stem cells, man. That's it. Oh God, uh, he needs to go to Germany or Mexico. I don't I don't know because Kobe Bryant Kobe Bryant went to Germany and Rey Mysterio went, went to Mexico, right? Yeah, I don't know where uh, Sting got his, but apparently that's the one that's got my attention the most obviously <laughs> uh will andrew garfield play spider-man again this one i'm gonna say yes i think he is going to come back i actually think they're bringing him back for a new maybe movie or franchise because i think the big i don't reveal, th- i don't know that he is going to be in an i think the bigger reveal though. after all these stupid spider-man spinoffs with the venom shit oh yeah venom's in this movie by the way people but uh, yeah, we didn't talk about it. Technically, he is. He's in a post yeah. scene. That I think happen. eventually they're going to reveal that it's the Andrew Garfield universe. Eventually, I hope, and I think that's the right thing to is, do. Is Andrew Garfield really going to come back for it, though? I don't know, man. Like, if Andrew Garfield is going to come if back, I think it has to, look, to be. First. To me, it just seems like he loves playing the character and loves getting the love. And now that he knows that it wasn't just him that they hated, they hated the scripts. You know what I mean? Like that was but the whole it, commentary of all. To me, he's not going to come back unless the script isn't terrible. And I don't know if you've looked at the other Spider-Man movie that are not the Spider-Man or the animated Spider-Man, but uh, they're not great. <laughs> we'll we'll see because there's Morbius, two Venoms, and uh, this upcoming yeah. Raven Hunter. Not yeah. good. Not good. But that would be my bet because uh, yeah, that's the only thing that makes sense in my head. And then of course Secret Wars. So, so Brian. Is Tom Holland going to play Spider-Man in a solo movie again? Oh, of course, of course. I'm sure they got that I don't know. pipeline. I, I am very. I think he's coming back. I I specifically said solo movie because I think he is guaranteed to come back. I think there's a possibility that he doesn't come back for a solo movie. I don't know. I I feel like Stoney's going to lock him down because like not it's not just that it's like he's the face of the Uncharted franchise now, which did good. Like, it didn't do great, but it did good. So, there's a lot on the line, especially, like, with it being a video game franchise now and to him potentially being in a lot more future Sony movies potentially down the line. Like, do you, like he's a guy you can put in, like, a Ghostbusters movie as, like, a villain maybe or something like that. Crazy. Something crazy maybe. like that. If he really I mean, wants to do me... something like, if he really wants to push himself creatively, you can still give him IP to work with and give him a challenging role, I think. You know what I mean? I also think the other issue is, like, he's, you know, he's, of course, getting older. I, I also think it's it's what's going to happen with Disney and Sony. Is that situation going to get resolved in some way? Like, I think that's that is also a, a major issue because, you know, it very like we are at a point when the X Men and the Fantastic Four they're back in the Marvel family, so to speak. Uh, Hulk seems like we are moving closer and closer to Hulk fully being a part of Marvel and getting away from Universal. It, it really feels like Spider-Man's kind of going to be the odd man out at some point, and I'm very curious to see uh, where that leads us. And who knows? There's going to be more consolidation as well. We'll, we'll have to see how this all develops. Or you, am, can just push, you can push him live action Miles Morales to replace him. There you go. I am, I am skeptical at this point of Tom Holland playing Spider-Man in a solo movie again, and I would not have said that in 2021, but again, given the fact that we have had these strikes, given Tom Holland's commentary given the issues with Sony and Disney in the past, because I just don't feel like Tom Holland wants to play this unless he is potentially still a part of the MCU. Um, So yeah, I I definitely think he will be in one of the Avengers movies because of the contractual obligation, but I'm not sure if that's going to happen elsewhere. So that, that is it uh, for our discussion. And uh, what a robust discussion it was about Spider-Man No Way Home, the newest entry into the real world's superhero pantheon. Brian, any final thoughts? Even though Spider-Man 2 didn't make it back in the day when we had a you know initial episode about it, this kind of makes up for it, I guess. But uh, Spider-Man 2 is in my personal pantheon, of course, in my heart. But uh, in terms of ranking the live-action Spider-Mans, this is definitely what at the top of the list for me next to Spider-Man 2. If you uh, exclude those awesome animated movies that have come out in the recent years, so, but yeah, I think uh, this is an accomplished. This is definitely an accomplishment and a once in a lifetime movie that I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. 
we are going to come back with at least one more episode of Superhero Pantheon. It's going to be a little bit different. We'll explain that when the time comes. But, Brian, September is your month. I know you are really excited for what we're doing in September. Yeah, it's a Creature Feature Month, and I'm really excited about this because this is a... I've been pushing these kind of creature features on Jerome for a little bit for a while, and it's not necessarily even cheesy ones. I think these are legit good, suspenseful movies, Uh, some really fun movies as well. So we're going to kick it off right off the bat with Alligator from 1980, and of course this is known for being a Robert Forrester flick, and you know he's just a serious motherfucker in this movie despite the crazy horror that's going on around him. But I think Alligator is a really underrated creature feature movie for sure that actually plays on suspense and not just, you know, typical gore you know like oh my god what did i just see kind of you know that kind of thing i think it really plays with your emotions uh i think it's a really really well-made movie and then we're gonna go to tremors from 1990 starring kevin bacon man that movie's a lot of fun i've seen it so many times in my lifetime and it's actually the reason i picked it as well is because in october we're doing underrated horror sequels and which i will review also tremors 2 and host that one so it's kind of a setup for one and two uh, I think this movie is a, a classic. I know, I know it's a cult classic in a lot of people's hearts, so I think this is Jerome's first time watching it, so that's going to be fun. And then we're going to both watch a movie for the first time called Deep Rising, which is, of course, we mentioned it during the Mummy Review, directed by Stephen Summers. I've heard a lot of fun things about this movie. Supposedly, it's a really fun creature feature movie. It's not like one of those like abyss knockoffs from the late 1980s, early 1990s, where it was some kind of creature feature in the water. Uh, this kind of goes beyond that and has some fun with it, so that's what I've heard. And then we're going to end it with Shin Godzilla from 2016, a movie that I've been pushing on Jerome, and Jerome's kind of open to it now. And hopefully, if that's successful, we're going to have a Godzilla month in the near, near future. Hopefully, we'll discuss that towards the end of the year. But uh, Shin Godzilla is a hell of a movie, and it really makes... I wouldn't say it makes fun of the Japanese government, but I think it puts a lot of emphasis on the Japanese government's decision-making in crisis times and the inability to do so, which ties into, we'll we'll get into that, but, you know, the earthquake of 2012 and the the indecision-making of the Japanese government that led to a lot of tragedies, more so tragedies that would have happened if they didn't immediately act without the whole bureaucracy getting in the way kind of thing. And that's kind of what Shin Godzilla is all about. It's a little different, but it's, it's really great stuff. So where that's for creature feature month of the month of September, I'm excited. I'm hosting it. And uh, we're going to go all over the place, eighties, nineties, modern day. So it's going to be fun. And uh, I hope Jerome is not disappointed in my choices based on the uh, choices from Brendan Fraser month. But I think these are going to, they're going to warm up to your heart a little bit. I think. I'm actually excited to review and discuss Shin Godzilla. I think that's the one that I'm most curious about, so we'll see how that develops. And uh, oh, we've got a lot of exciting things coming up the rest of 2023, regardless of the strikes that are going on. Go back and listen to our discussion of all the franchises, including a last-minute change as we discussed the Star Trek movies instead of the Fast movies. So go check that out for Brian. My name is Jerome. Thank you so much for listening. We will be back again next week. The one thing, though, I just wish they brought back that Nickelback song, Hero. I would have marked the fuck out for that.